We are delighted that you can come and join with us uh, this morning uh, for um, our first uh, installment really here in what we could call our virtual church uh, for the next number of weeks. We're glad that you can be with us and to meet around God's precious truth uh, with us today. Uh, we want to read a few verses uh, from the very first book of Scripture, Genesis chapter 6, and we'll read from the verse number 1. Let's hear the word of God. It says, And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his day shall be an hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old, men of renown. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing, and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. May the Lord bless the reading of his word to our hearts. We want to uh, commence a study uh, over the next number of weeks on the life of the man Noah that we read of here in Genesis well, we just buy in a brief word of prayer as we come uh, to meet around God's precious truth. Let us pray. Our eternal Heavenly Father, we do indeed thank Thee that we can enter into Thy presence at the throne of heavenly grace. We thank Thee, Father, that although even uh, we're not able to meet in the church at this time, Father, we do thank Thee that it is Thy people that is the church. And we thank Thee that even as we gather in this uh, means here, Father, we do thank Thee that uh, Thy presence is still with us. We thank Thee that where the twos and threes are gathered, that You're there in the midst. And we believe that even in this format, as we meet together to study Thy Word, that Thou art here and that to bless. We pray You'll open up the Scripture of truth. We pray for all that would be tuning in, whether now or in the days that lie ahead, that there would be that Word in season for every heart and every soul. Bless me now as I open up the scriptures of truth fill me full of God, the Holy Spirit, and may everything that is said and done be for thy honour and for thy glory, for it's in our Saviour's precious name we pray. Amen. Now when we think of Noah, the first thing I'm sure that will come to our mind is the account of Noah and the great flood, Noah and the ark. Of course, we know that God was bringing the people of the land under judgment for their sin. He's told Noah that he was going to send that flood uh, to destroy uh, everything on the face of the earth. But God provided a means of salvation and he told uh, Noah to build the ark. And perhaps in our minds we can uh, see all the colourful pictures from the front of children's books uh, depicting that great story of Noah and the ark. However, there's so much recorded for us here about Noah that happens in this account and around this great account of the flood. It doesn't all uh, focus here on uh, that children's uh, story that we so often uh, hear in children's meetings. There's so much uh, to the background here and in the build-up to this account that is so relevant and so important for us to consider. Now it is true, of course, humanly speaking, that uh, Noah is the central figure in the biblical account of the flood, humanly speaking. In chapters 6, 7 and 8 of Genesis, the chapters which record uh, the account of the flood, Noah is mentioned or referred to uh, on more than 80 occasions. And therefore, when Scripture gives such a significant place to this man, uh, well then it is only right and it's only proper that we study 
what scripture would have to say about him and indeed his life. Now Noah had a very significant lifespan. Only two men are recorded for us in scripture as having lived for a longer period than this man Noah. Noah lived 950 years as it's recorded for us. Methuselah, Noah's grandfather, lived 969 years and Jared, his great-great-grandfather, lived for 900 and 62 years and to give a sense of the lifespan of this man Noah and what he would have learnt and indeed of what he would have witnessed himself or very closely uh, second hand uh, Noah knew Methuselah who lived in Adam's lifespan and Noah himself lived in the lifespan of Abraham and so this man Noah had a direct connection to or a direct witness of uh, really the first 25 chapters of the book of Genesis and that's an incredible span of time in which many things are recorded for us in God's word and you know the life of Noah is a great lesson uh, in many respects a great example for all of God's people in spite of a wicked generation in which uh, Noah lived he lived a life which was holy he lived a life which was faithful to God he was a, a faithful preacher of God's truth and that earned him the title in Second Peter chapter 2 and the verse 5 as a preacher of righteousness and that's the title really we want to give these series of messages Noah a preacher of righteousness and that's a challenge not only to me as a preacher but it's a challenge to every child of God speaking hypothetically of course but what if scripture was penned for the first time today what if it was being penned in the age in which we live? Would we make it onto its pages being described as a preacher of righteousness? That's a very challenging thought indeed. Noah's faith in building the ark in the midst of a dry land. Noah's faith in boarding that ark when the rain hadn't yet fallen. It earned Noah a place in what is known as the hall of faith in Hebrews chapter 11. And in verse number 7, we read these words, By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world, and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. And then Noah's fall into drunkenness, which of course was the last recorded incident really in his life. It serves as a great warning to God's people that we must never let our guard down to temptation we must always be watching we must always be ready to resist the onslaught of the enemy and not only this but the very flood the very account which Noah is perhaps most remembered for today has shaped most of the earth's landscape as even we know it today and we have of course that reminder of God's bow placed in the sky so often <coughs> visible to us. And so the purpose of a study such as this is not only that we might learn more of scripture and gain a head knowledge. Of course these things are good. These things are necessary. And I have found in my own study that I learn most and gain much when preparing for a series such as this. When we're getting in <coughs> excuse me, to the real depth of an issue and studying the character of a, a, a bible man or woman but i want this study to be more than just us gaining a, a head knowledge but i pray that we will all learn lessons here from the life of noah whether it's lessons on what to do or perhaps lessons on what not to do i want us all to make it a prayer that the spirit of god would apply the head knowledge that we trust that we will learn that we would apply it through the Spirit of God to our own hearts. <clears throat> but today we want to consider the first part of our study. We'll be focusing on the words that we've read here in Genesis chapter 6 and the verses 1 to 7. And we want to consider uh, in this first part of our series the defilement around Noah. The defilement around Noah. You see, Noah entered into this scene of time, he entered into a great period of defilement a great period of wickedness on the earth 
They were days that in so many ways are akin to the days in which we live today. Matthew 24 and the verse 37, our Savior says, But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. And as we draw closer to the second coming of our Savior, of course we don't know <coughs> when that is, but we can be certain that the moral state of the land is becoming more and more corrupt. Back really to hear what it's described as in the days and in the time of Noah. Noah's age was marked by wickedness. It was marred with immorality. If we were to pick an age into which uh, to be born, it would certainly not be this age of Noah. And so it's a period of uh, great trouble. And we want to notice firstly here that, that it is a period of defilement. It's a period of defilement. In verse 1 of Genesis <coughs> chapter 6, we read these words. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them. This was a period of an exploding population. The obvious reason for this explosion in the population was the fact that the more the population grows, well then the more it multiplies. For example, if we were to start with a salary of one pound a day, but if that salary was to double every day throughout the month, well then our salary at the end of the month would be greatly increased from that original one pound. And so too it is here with the population in the days and at the time of Noah. I don't know much about these men, but there was a Dr. Whitcomb Jr. and a Dr. Henry Morris. And they calculated that if the population was rising by about 1.5% a day pre-flood, then by the time we get to the flood, the population could have been approximately 1 billion people. Now, of course, that could be higher, uh, given the length of time that people lived in the days of Noah. But the point is that the events recorded for us here in Genesis 6, they're not only affecting a small number of people. They're not only, uh, 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 they're not only affecting a, a small number of isolated people in part of the world. No, the earth was well populated. Men and women were spread across the face of the earth. This flood wasn't just affecting one particular part of the land. Likewise, the defilement that we read of here, it wasn't confined to a particular part of earth, but rather the whole earth was defiled. The fall of man had corrupted the entire earth. The defilement spoken of at the time of Noah here, it was in relation uh, to a substantial population. We're not to minimize what we read here. The wickedness of man was great. And as men and women multiplied, they passed their corrupted nature on to their offspring. And thus the defilement and the wickedness grew and grew and grew. I heard one of our own free Presbyterian ministers saying during a sermon one time that the only thing that we can pass to our children is a corrupt nature. We cannot pass our salvation unto them. We cannot make them righteous. We cannot make them holy. But the only thing that we can pass to our children is a corrupted soul. And how true that is. And that's what's happening here to the exploding population in the day of Noah. As the population grew, so did the defilement and so did the wickedness. We have the same trend, don't we, today? Don't we think of the big cities of the world being the centres of wickedness, being the centres of defilement, where large numbers of people congregate, there's an abundance of sin. Of course, we know that sin is not restricted to the large cities and towns, but certainly where there's a large cluster of people, there is great defilement. And so it is here as we read of it in the days of Noah. Not only do we see uh, the period of this defilement. But we see here the particulars of this defilement. Scripture doesn't just give a general picture of what's happening in the days of Noah, but it reveals to us the very particulars of the wickedness, the very specifics of the defilement that was prominent in the day and time of Noah. And there are three particular sins, three uh, particular corruptions that are referred to here. At the very beginning of Genesis 6. Firstly there were corrupt marriages. 
In verse number one, there's a specific reference made uh, to uh, the fact that there were daughters born unto them. Now, clearly that doesn't mean that only now were daughters beginning to be born. That's impossible because otherwise the population would not be growing. But the phrase introduces to us what really is about to be said about these daughters in the following verse, verse number two. It's introducing us to one of the great defilements that was so prominent in the days of Noah. It's not suggesting that the daughters were the problem per se, but rather that there was a moral problem of an inappropriate emphasis on those daughters. There was a corrupt and defiling view of them by many in the land. That's something that mirrors our day. We don't need to go into the detail of it. But you will know what I mean when we speak of how in this day we have the objectification of women in our day. As it was present in the day of Noah. In the days of Noah these women were looked upon in lustful ways. And this lust led to the problem of corrupt marriages that we read of here in verse number 2. Because we read there that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. There was a corrupt criteria for their marriage. And of course, we know there's nothing wrong with beauty. It's not sinful for women to be beautiful. It's not sinful to think a woman is beautiful or fair. However, it is wrong to look with lust and sinful desire. And that's what these men were doing here in the time of Noah. The criteria for marriage was not the will of God, but rather it was how the women looked. If the women were fair to look upon, then they were the ones that the men wanted to marry. And we're to remember here a very solemn truth that this is speaking, as it says in verse 2, of the sons of God. Speaking of the sons of God. And they didn't care about the spiritual qualifications. They didn't care about personality or anything else. They looked for outward beauty alone. And how prominent is such thinking in our land today. Outward beauty is often the only thing that is considered by worldly men. Isn't that the focus of Hollywood? Isn't that the focus of the celebrity circle? And yet how many marriages there actually survive? And you know, I fear for the youth of the day. I fear that they would stumble in to such a way and into such a thinking as this. And we're to pray for the youth of our denomination. We're to pray for the youth of this land, that the God would keep them on the straight and narrow. And that he would give them godly marriages. And that the young people of our denomination would, would pray about a godly partner. And about a godly wife or a godly husband. Not only was there corrupt criteria, but there was corrupt choice in these marriages. Verse 2, it tells us here that this is the way these men actually chose to marry. Here were the descendants of the godly line of Seth, the sons. The daughters were the descendants of the ungodly line of Cain. And that is why they're not called daughters of God. But scripture refers to them as the daughters of men. And these men of the godly line were marrying women of an ungodly line. They were unequally yoked in the eyes of God. Second Corinthians 6 and the verse 14 reminds us that we're to be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness and what communion hath light with darkness. And it was the corrupt view with which men viewed these women that led to their corrupt choice in marrying them. And really, to put it simply, we could say that the marriages here that were taking place in the land in the days of Noah, they were not good marriages. They were not godly marriages. And as a result, it created problems for the moral strength of society itself. Isn't it true that marriage, the home, the family, is one of the great pillars of society? It's an institution that is ordained by God. And so when this pillar, this God-ordained institution is corrupted, then society is corrupted. And don't we see that uh, today? There's an attack on the godly institution of marriage between a man and a woman. There's an attack on the home. 
There's an attack on the family unit. There's an attack on this divine institution of God. And is it any wonder then that our society is in the mess that it's in? Is it any wonder that our children are going astray? Is it any wonder we look around us and we see the mess uh, that the world is in? Satan and his army are attacking the very pillars of our society. And it was happening here in the days of Noah. This is not a new thing. And brethren and sisters were to pray for the protection of God's institution of marriage. We're to pray for the protection of the family unit. Because Satan has been trying to corrupt it for generations. And he will try to corrupt it for generations to come if God spares us. There were corrupt marriages. But there were also corrupt men here in the days of Noah. Verse 4 of Genesis chapter 6 says this. There were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that when the sons of God came in. Unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them. The same became mighty men which are of old, men of renown. The word translated for giants here in the authorized version of Scripture is the Hebrew word which means bully or tyrant. And our focus then here, it shouldn't be on the physical stature of these men, but rather it should be on their character. These men were tyrants. John Butler said of these men, whose might was in violence, not their physical size. And we learn here that these men had a reputation across the world for their violence. That's why this verse describes them as men of renown. These violent and cruel men were the heroes of the day. This is who the population looked up to. They were renowned. They were respected for their violence and for their cruel and vile behavior. And we see a parallel. So often in the world today, who are the heroes? The world today, there are those of Hollywood. There are those of the celebrity circle, men and women who so often have little, if no moral character at all. Men and women who live lives of adultery, drunkenness and immortality. And that's who uh, people are looking up to today. That's who the generation coming behind us are aspiring to be like. And dear believer, that should really worry us. That's a fearful thing. That's why we need to be doing all we can as believers and as a church to be seeking to win children and young adults to Christ. We cannot put a value, we cannot put a price on seeking to win them for the Saviour, seeking to bring them in to the glorious light of the gospel. Notice what it says in verse 4. When the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old men for a nine. Do you see what's happening here? The offspring of these corrupt marriages that we spoke of just a few minutes ago, these marriages between the godly line of Seth and the women of the world, the offspring of these marriages were just like these tyrants. They were just like these wicked men of old. And you know, it's a truth that sin breeds sin. In the days of Noah, it is spiraling here into a sinful chaos. This was a time of great declension as the, pos as the population grew. So did the immorality. Dear friend, that's the importance of providing a good start for our children, for our grandchildren. Homes with godly fathers, homes with godly mothers, homes with godly grandfathers and grandmothers, homes with marriages that are founded upon Christ. Why? Because our society depends upon it. There were corrupt marriages, there were corrupt men. We also see here another defilement was corrupt minds. Corrupt minds. In verse 5, uh, we read these words, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Every imagination of the thoughts of the heart of man was only evil continually. Noah's day was characterized by evil thoughts. And of course, when we think of what we've noticed already and how the men viewed the women, is it any wonder that the people's minds were full of corruption and evil? Are we surprised that that's the case? Because the very thought of man characterizes man himself. Many 
Of course, today we'll say, well, it's only what you do that counts. It's only what you do that matters. But yet we must remember that what we do is always a result of what we think. Proverbs 23 and the verse 7 says, For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. And evil thoughts will lead always, or mostly anyway, to evil actions. The evidence for that is clear as we consider it here in the days of Noah. How we think, the thoughts we think, will affect how we act. Someone once said, sow a thought, we reap an act. Sow an act, we reap a habit. Sow a habit, we reap a character. Sow a character, we reap a destiny. You see, it all begins with a thought. Dear believer, we're to guard our thought life. We're to guard our minds. We're to be careful about the things we think in our minds and in our hearts because inevitably these things will eventually manifest themselves in our actions. In Mark chapter 7 and the verse 21 onwards, Christ said this, For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, viciousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. And all these evil things come from within and defile the man. Speaking of the things that defile the man, the first here that is mentioned is evil thoughts. Evil thoughts defile the man. The men in the days of Noah here that we've read about, they had evil thoughts. They had evil imaginations. The, evil, uh, the extent of this evil is seen here in the fact that it was every imagination. It wasn't just some. It wasn't most, but rather it was every. And further to that, we read here uh, that uh, it was evil continually. This was habitual sin. This was the very way that the men in the days of Noah lived their lives. One commentator said this is not a description of a people who have a bad thought once in a while. Of course we're not excusing that. But it is a description of people whose mind is in the gutter 24 hours of the day. This is not a temporary situation, but a perpetual situation. This is the darkness. This is the defilement that marked the population in the days of Noah. And sadly, it's the darkness. Sadly, it's the defilement that marks the population in the days in which we live. Noah was born into a dark. He was born into a defiled age. And this is the backdrop. This is the context here in which we're introduced to this man, Noah. And there's more to say on this first point in the series regarding the defilement around Noah. But we'll cover that in the will of God in the next video. Let us bow in a word of prayer as we bring our time around God's word to a close today our heavenly father we do indeed thank thee for this time we spent around the scripture of truth and father we must acknowledge that it grieves our hearts when we think of the defilement in the day of noah and it grieves us further that when we look around us we can see so much that characterizes our day is the same as that in the day of noah and father we pray that in wrath you'll remember mercy we pray that you will come Sweeping through this land once again, revive the hearts of thy people and bring lost sinners to that saving knowledge of Christ as their own and personal saviour. May thy word be written upon every heart. Bless each and every one that would tune in to hear thy truth and be with us until we would meet around thy word again. For it's in our saviour's precious and holy name we pray. Amen.